<laughs> I know, right? With the okay, with the technology. Okay. No, 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 no. Yeah, I had to do that too. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. I should try and do it. North German no, church. German church. Oh, German German church. church. I wonder if there's a German church on Israel. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Indianapolis. Yeah, do all this. Right. This is crazy. Four, six, two, three, five. Two, one, five, one. United States. Yeah. Oh, got it. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Jill Lambert, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Um, welcome to the Breaking Down Barriers Fall Symposium pre um, presented by the Indiana Council for Exceptional Children. Um, again, thank you for joining us. Very excited. I want you to know this um, session will be recorded and we will share it out after the conclusion of the symposium. We're hopeful that you're going to walk away with valuable information um, that will help you in your role of supporting staff, students, and the entire school community. But before we begin, I just want to make you aware that questions should be entered through the question and answer format. At the end of the session, we'll allow the presenter um, to answer as many questions as time will permit. Sessions, again, will be recorded and shared. At the end of today's symposium, you'll be asked to complete an exit ticket. Um, we will invite you to provide feedback, which is a valuable gift to us. Now, I am very pleased and honored to introduce um, Dr. Murph. And let's see here. Um, Dr. Murph has over 24 years of experience in education. She feels honored to have spent the majority of her educational career in one school district, which is located in a large metropolitan city. Dr. Murph is currently the curriculum coordinator for the language assistance program in her school district. She served as an elementary school principal for 14 years prior to her new role. She has served as an assistant principal and elementary school teacher. She's a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Dr. Murph and her husband, Daryl Murph, are the proud parents of three amazing children, Mackenzie, Lincoln, and Avery. She strongly believes her most important role in life is being their mother. They are her greatest blessings. And I can say it's just such an honor. I've known Dr. Murph's Murph personally and professionally. Our daughters went to preschool together. So it's just great that we're reunited today. So Dr. Murph, I will let you take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today and to share with you. Um, I know our time is going to go by so fast. And so again, thank you for that introduction because it's an honor to be here today. Um, I've been in Wayne Township for, this is actually the start of my 25th year. So I am so grateful for those opportunities. And again, thank you, Jill, because we have, our babies have grown up together, played on basketball teams together, and it's always nice to come back and to connect. And so this morning, just to get started, because I know our time will fly by, I'm going to focus on, for this conference, the power of your voice. Because I truly believe that our voice has power. Our voice is our greatest tool that we can use before we can get started on those actions. Now, when I think about introducing myself, people always think, okay, 
who is this person in front of us? What does she have to share? I feel like everyone always has something to share, but I really am passionate about working with students that have special needs. Um, when we think about students that are historically marginalized in the educational setting, that's an area of passion for me. Um, in 2017, I received my PhD from Purdue in educational leadership. And my focus, and even the book that I wrote, was about culturally responsive practices. And I love Twitter, y'all. So if you love Twitter, follow me. I always follow back, but I have learned so much. And it's still Twitter to me. I haven't really crossed over to calling it X yet. But those are my two handles. And I've also started consulting work as well. Now, as we dive into this work, I want us to really think about the fact that in order to have a teaching and learning environment where all students can thrive, and I want to say that again, all students can thrive. We have to be able to focus on equity, inclusivity, anti-racism, and culturally responsive practices at the heart of that work. Because if we don't do those things, we're going to miss out on groups of students. And our work as educators and as advocates, um, and even for us as parents, we want to make sure that every student gets the education that they deserve. Now, whenever I do workshops or keynotes, I always want to give a little bit of historical context because I feel that if we can know our history, it will help us to move forward in a much more productive way. And so I just listed a few of the court cases and the educational acts that we've looked at over the years. And I want you to take a moment and look at those. I'm starting with Brown versus Boer because that was a monumental court case that was designed to open the doors of the schoolhouse for everyone to integrate schools. And it was also instrumental for students that have special needs. And then we move on to the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the Equal Educational Opportunities Act, then IDEA, and then finally No Child Left Behind. And the reason I bring those up to you today is that despite all of this work that took place starting in 1954, we know that each of these cases and educational acts had an impact. Some of the impact was positive. Some of it actually could be perceived as negative. But I want us to think about just for a moment with each one of these acts, what were the intended and the unintended consequences? And that's deep because everyone doesn't like to think of it in a negative aspect. But there were some consequences that were not, they were not intended. We think about the people that had access by the law, but couldn't still actually gain that access without a huge fight, without losing out on educational opportunities that they deserved, without having the opportunity to join students um, that may not look like them or who may have something else um, that they had to share. And so historically marginalized students continue, even today in 2023, they continue to have inequities in their educational outcomes. And it is up to us to use our voice to create change for them. And so if we think about as we start this work every year, the school year has started for everyone here on this webinar. And when we think about it, we always come into the school year with a fresh mindset, with a, a, you know, a clear set of, of views and missions that we want to have for our young people, especially for our students that have special needs. But I want to think about the idea of inequity by design. Now, when we think about inequity by design, that is really not what we came into education for. We know that we got an education because we wanted to help students learn and grow. We wanted them to become their best selves. We wanted to provide them with support. But if we're honest with ourselves, we know that there are inequities. And many people have shared that the educational system is a system like anything else. And this system is doing exactly what it was designed to do. There have been the creation of the haves and the creation of the have nots. And that's hard for some people to really think about because again, we know what we got an education for. We know we wanna help students learn and grow. But then we have to think about the notion of the intent versus the impact. As we think about inequities that surface and they may show up in small ways, but also in huge ways, we understand that good intentions can have negative impacts. The traditional school setting that has been used for many years 
it does not meet the needs of our neurodivergent students. And if we're honest with ourselves, it doesn't meet the needs of majority of students. The way that students want to learn does not always match up with those traditional frameworks that we've designed. And so if we think historically, again, education began as a way for the elite to be educated, to run the country. Then as an industrial age came about, we begin to have more of an industrial age model, sit in those roles, make sure everything is lined up, make sure they can run those factories, those assembly lines. But there was still an education for those that would lead and those that would follow. And so that industrial age, that we know that has to go. Our young people do not enjoy learning that way and they do not keep those skills. So the sit and get model isn't beneficial for majority of our students but it's especially detrimental for our students who learn in a different way. Those old ways are not serving our students and we have to think outside the box. We must disrupt this system. And if we disrupt this system, we can remove barriers that create those inequities by design. I wanna take a look down memory lane, okay? Take a look at these pictures. Just for a moment, just take a look at the pictures in front of you. The people that have had positive outcomes in education, they love to talk about memory lane or the good old days. What do you see in these pictures? Think about what you see that is missing. Because remember, the good old days weren't good for everyone. When I look at these pictures, I don't see a lot of diversity in some of the settings. In some, I see materials and books. In the picture at the bottom, I see some diversity in that picture, but I don't see lots of materials and resources. I think about the fact that I don't see students that have a visible disability. I see a student standing at the front of the room, and I think about those students who may have challenges reading and how detrimental that was for them to have to read in front of a group. I think about how in one picture you have lots of eager hands, but if you look further back, there are students that don't have their hands raised. So as we think about moving forward into our, our learning and our growing and our teaching practices, we have to remember that memory lane wasn't great for everyone. And what can we do to create that learning space where people feel welcomed, they feel valued, they feel heard, they feel respected, despite the fact that they may learn differently. So this next slide, and the thing, I use slides because I love visuals. But I want us to remember that many times the voices of the oppressors are prioritized over the voices of the oppressed. I want you to think about students that you've worked with. Think about that picture we just saw, those that may be, have been excluded in the good old days. Think about the historically marginalized students that were missing in those photos. Think about if we created a space where our young people can thrive and not just feel like they're surviving every day. If you've ever heard of Dr. Bettina Love, she talks about wanting to have a school setting, wanting a school setting where students feel they can thrive and not just feel that they're surviving. I want us to think about, when we think about the voices of oppressors, that sounds so strong, but I want you to think about young people who have been denied access to learning spaces that they deserve to be in. I want you to think about the voices that have said, oh, we can't do that. That's not gonna work. We need to figure something else out. That's not fair to the other students. How are we gonna make this work? And that person may not see themselves as an oppressor because that's such a strong word, but it really is just that. I want us to remember that our voices, our voices are here to help us ensure equitable outcomes for our students. Because if we are denying our students, especially those that have special needs with access to honors courses, AP courses, high quality learning opportunities, and for some of our students that may have severe disabilities, sometimes just basic access to the general education setting. Think about the excuses and the reasons that we have for that and how does that contribute to those words? 
So think about that for a second and really identify ways that we could dismantle that. Because if we can dismantle that, we are then going to create those positive conditions for learning. And I always think about what does it mean to create those conditions for learning? You know, as a teacher, as an assistant principal, as a school leader, as a district leader, you know, I am able to hear lots of different conversations about equity and access. I'm able to think outside the box to help people in the school setting create those conditions for learning to be a thought partner, to come alongside individuals so that we can have that setting where all can thrive. So just for a moment, I'm just gonna pause for a minute and I want you to jot down two or three things that come to your mind when you think about what a thriving environment would look like for exceptional learners. And as I'm talking, I want you to allow yourself to dream. I want you to be a visionary. Be a visionary in this work as you think of your students that you work with every day. But I also want us to begin to ask students. I think that's a huge piece of the puzzle that's missing. We need to ask our students, what do they think about this particular learning environment? How do they learn best? Allow them to share with you what they need because no one's gonna know what they need better than the individual themselves. Ask students, and for those that may not be able to articulate, connect with their families and ask them what they've seen as well. We have to be able to create these spaces, not just with the knowledge that we hold, but with the knowledge that our young people hold because they know what they need for success. I want us to stop focusing on fixing students. And share that with your colleagues. Tell them we need to stop trying to fix students. Instead, we need to look at ways to dismantle and fix the system that is creating these outcomes. Because as we look at our students have been, who have been historically underserved, I really truly feel that if we don't dismantle and fix the system, that their lives are at stake because they're not gonna be able to get to those goals that they have for themselves and create the life that they want to have for themselves. I want us, as we create these conditions for learning, to think about how do we create spaces grounded in love and joy and compassion? Because I really feel like this work can be done when we are grounded in intentionality. Think of what it means if students, especially those that can have learning challenges, or even behavioral challenges. The fact that they come to school because they have to, but they don't experience any joy in that space. If you don't experience joy and feel that safety, you're not gonna be able to learn at a high level. So I challenge you to think about that. What does a thriving learning environment look like for our exceptional learners? And then note that our words have power, our words have authority. When we think about the words that we speak over our young children, especially those that have special needs, our words, they can create harm or they can create hope. Do we want to create hope for them or do we want to inflict harm? And we know as educators, we want to be able to look at them and give them the hope that they need and then the strategies that they need to be successful. You know, growing up, I was always taught that our words can bless or our words can curse someone. And it may sound like strong language, but I want us to really think about adults who growing up, they still remember an educator or educators who did not believe in them. I know adults that I talk to, and to be honest, they can clearly remember negative comments said about them in school, whether it was something said out loud to them something written on a report card or a progress report. And some of these adults actually can go back in time in their mind and their memory, and they can tell you where they were standing in the class when they heard it. They can tell you who the individual was that said it. Some of them even have sensory connections to that. One person said they could still smell that teacher because the words that were used to describe them as they were struggling through school were not words that were kind, not words that were uplifting, not words that gave them hope, but words that actually inflicted harm upon them. 
So I was raised to believe that there is life and death in the power of the tongue. And I want us to use our voice and our words and use those in an authoritative way to create the change that is desperately needed for our students that are exceptional learners. You know, think about the staff lounge comments, team meetings, data teams, things you hear in the hallway, comments made um, in classrooms after school. When we hear those things, how do we use our power of our voice to push back on those statements? How do we manage that pushback when it comes our way? How do we ensure that we do speak up so that our students are heard and they know that they have an advocate in us? And so you do have the opportunity to do that and don't let those opportunities pass you by because I promise those are things that will bother you when you're going to bed at night. There are things where you will see that child again who may, be, who may have been the center of that conversation and you will have a flicker of just a moment where you wish you had said something. And so I really want us to think about the power and authority in our words and how we can use that to really push back when things are said that shouldn't be said. As we're sitting in case conferences, as we're thinking about 504 meetings, what are we gonna say to have that other narrative, to provide that hope? Think about that for a second. Now, as we think about that, I want us to draw back on hopes and dreams. This picture is very important to me. Um, this actually is a picture of my ancestors. And I think about hopes and dreams. And I think about the hopes and dreams of our students and of our families, of our community. And when I look at this picture, this picture gave me great hope as I was going through difficult times, as I was going through my educational journey, my leadership journey, um, as things were happening to me that I felt were out of my control when I was using my voice, but I felt like I am tired of using my voice all the time. I'm tired of advocating. I keep getting pushed back. I feel like there's a target on my back. This picture gave me strength and it continued to fill me with hope because right sitting, sitting in the bottom of that picture, that is my great, great, great grandmother Rose. And she was a slave. As a little girl, she was a slave. And I know that she had great hopes and dreams for all of her children and her children's children and all of her descendants, okay? When I think of that phrase, I am the hope and the dream of the slave, she did not know that one day I would be Dr. Denisha Murph, but I'm sure she had some hope on the inside that someone would. And in our family, we use this picture as a reminder of the great things we can do because we are strong and we can go against all obstacles. But when I look at this picture and you look at each people, each person on there, my Aunt Thelma is being held, she's a little baby. That is my great-great-grandfather Dave, my great-grandfather Jeannie, and my grandmother Marie. Now, my grandmother Marie, she always told me that I was destined for greatness. She told all of her children, all of her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, that we were destined for great things. Now, what that is important to remember is that those are the things that were instilled in us in our home. But then we went to school and not everyone that we encountered had that same philosophy, okay? In my family, we have people that have struggled in school and excelled in school. We have those that had great experiences and those that had not so great experiences, but it never stopped us from hearing about the hopes and dreams of what we could be. And so I wanna connect this photo back to our families. All mothers, all families, they have hopes and dreams for their children. During pregnancy, the mother has hopes and dreams for her child. Now for some of us, when we think about disabilities, we have to remember that it's our job to come alongside families and help them with those hopes and dreams and help our young people realize their hopes and dreams. Some of the disabilities were known from the beginning. Others, it may have taken years before those, those surfaced. But we have to remember there was still that hope and that dream for a successful life. They send their children to us with those hopes and dreams firmly intact. And they're looking for us to partner with them to help those hopes and dreams to come true. 
they want to make sure that their child is in a space, a loving space. And I do use the word love because there has to be some love and care involved to ensure that their child can thrive in that space. And so as you're doing this work, I want you to think about the student and the family and never forget about those hopes and dreams because those hopes and dreams are what help to push and power us through even when the work gets hard. This requires us to just reimagine how to create that optimal learning environment for all. And it requires thinking outside the box. When I say that, I mean, if there's a child that needs an audio version, or if there's a child that we've, you know, we've given access to this higher level course, but the audio book isn't provided, we have to go through different hoops and hurdles to provide that student with that outlet, being encouraged to do that work. If it means this student that needs this particular accommodation. One thing I want to remind us of as adults is sometimes it bothers the adults. It does not bother the young people. If you ever go in a classroom and you can notice different pathways for learning and you see it, you will notice the only folks bothered are the visitors. When you've built that strong classroom community where people are honored and respected for who they are and what they bring to that setting, the young people are not concerned about who's maybe standing up, who may have a different copy of this, who's listening to something audible, who has a person working with them on the side. They become used to that in that learning community. And so as we go forth, I want us to think about our exceptional learners and think about four key things. I want you to think about for exceptional learners, number one, student voice and agency. Then I want you to think about the idea of liberation, identity and transformation, and intersectionality. Now, as we work with our exceptional learners, and I promise you this is powerful for them. We have to embrace and empower them through these four things. With student voice, I want us to really hone in and think about this for a minute. With student voice, we all know their student voice and their student agency. With student voice, our young people are able to share their voice, engage in discussions, and adults are coming alongside them in these areas. But student voice is the first step in developing student agency. And when I think about that, I really think about the fact that students love to share their thoughts, but many of our young people wanna move into action after that. So student agency requires them to use their voice first and then transfer that into actionable steps. Now, this gives them autonomy. They feel empowered. They feel a sense of responsibility and they know that they are making an impact on their community. Think about our students that are exceptional learners. They have so much power in sharing ways that they learn best. And what I wanna challenge people to think about is that if we can listen to them and make one change, one change, do you know how many students who may not even be identified in that classroom will benefit from that? If we tr stop trying to keep things just the same for everyone and allow ourselves to think differently and to provide these pathways for all of our students, we can create powerful change. So helping our young people to understand by using their voice that can transfer to student agency and it can make great impacts on the people around them in their community. So that helps them take that talking into doing because our young people will tell you they get tired of all that talking. They wanna actually do something and see the difference in the world around them. Now, the next one is liberation. When we think about liberation, that's a powerful term. But this work, equity work, is an act of liberation. Think about that. It is an act of liberation. This gives our young people liberation to be free to learn in a manner that honors their particular needs. What are their strengths? How are we highlighting those strengths? How are we liberating them and allowing them to feel free and not feeling they have to assimilate to the way that we want to do things here at school, but to feel that liberation, that freedom to learn in a way that best suits them? When we do this, we are truly leveling the playing field. 
again, a pet peeve of mine is when we come up with a new idea and someone says that's not fair to the other kids. We're not talking about the other kids. We're talking about this one child and the pathway that opens up, opens up access for them. What does that mean for them? It has nothing to do with these other children. And the other kids aren't even thinking about it. It's what we're thinking about as the adults in that setting. So again, I know I've said that before, but that is truly something that has to be dismantled and broken apart. Because if we think about what needs to be done to level the playing field, we are helping this child on their journey. When people would hit me with that, well, that's not fair. I would say, well, it's not fair that this student may have dyslexia or have a cognitive disability, either if we're going to talk about fair, but we're going to also talk about how do we help each individual to reach that level of success. That has to be a part of the conversation, and it has to be a part of the work, because if we can empower our young students through liberation, we are helping to create a humanized community of learners, and this humanized community of learners then becomes the adults who will have that humanized community out in the world. Those are the things that we need to focus on as we address injustices that will take place for them in that classroom setting. And then the identity and transformation. Now this one, this one is one that we really need to hone in on as well because we know our identity, that is very important. That is very important for our young people. You wanna be in a space that embraces your identity. And historically marginalized students, and I always use that term because sometimes people forget that when we're talking about historically marginalized, we're not just talking about race. We're not just talking about gender. We're talking about students that have special needs as well because they have been historically marginalized and historically underserved. We want to make sure that they are given time and space to embrace who they are, who feels accepted, who feels the ability to participate in the classroom setting. We want to make sure that they feel cared for in that learning environment because this helps them to experience a transformation to becoming who they are, they, who are they going to be. When we think about identity and we think about transformation, that is what we want to see throughout their pre-K through 12 education. And even as some of them go on to the college level, when we think about that, that is huge. This gives students the opportunity to learn. They learn what they need to be successful in the environment. And what's more important, they learn about self-advocacy. When they are strong in their, their identity and they've been able to transform who they are as an individual, they become a strong self-advocate. They can speak up and share what they need. They can tell others what they need. They learn how to use different tools and resources and that is so powerful. And then the final one is the intersectionality. This is important because first we, as educators, we must educate ourselves on identity conscious practices. How are we ensuring this accessibility for our English learners, for our students with special needs, for our students of color? How are we looking at this through that equity lens? We have to work to acknowledge that there are factors, there truly are factors that influence experiences in classrooms. And what kind of space are we creating to best support those students? When we have our exceptional learners and we can teach them about the intersectionality of their identities, they can use this to advocate for themselves. They feel empowered to use this knowledge. But we also have to make sure in that intersectionality piece that our children, they, our students, they know that they are more than just their disability. This is a part of their identity, but it is not the sum. And I can even share that as a parent of a child with a disability. You know, as we worked with him throughout his educational career, we were very honest about what this disability was for him, but it was not going to be a breaking point for him. Honestly, we told him that it's, this is a superpower for you because your brain thinks differently. You don't think that typical way, I call it that linear way, you think beautifully. You think outside the box. You are able to solve problems in a way that we never imagined possible. And in our family, we accentuated that. So he did not feel ashamed to tell people that he had dyslexia. And he was not ashamed. He was able to speak up for himself, advocate for himself for teachers. It didn't come instantly. It was a journey. 
But we made sure in our family we did that and that we surrounded him with educators who also believe that. And so I know that self-advocacy and empowerment is huge because it is life changing. And I could see that happen right before our eyes. So I encourage you to help them embrace that as well. Now, I would be remiss if I did not pull in a little research into this keynote speech. And I know that we all know John Hattie and his work. But when we think about creating equitable access and using our voice for that equity, that, that powerful equity piece, I want us to go back to the research on belonging. John Hattie says those teacher-student interactions are powerful and they do have the potential to accelerate. If we're able to create a space where all students feel respected, included, accepted, and encouraged by others, we know that their learning will increase because they are able to take off that mental mask and feel free to embrace who they are and their learning styles, to learn more and to grow more. That school connectedness, connectedness piece is powerful. And the effect size for this is 0 0.40, which was that hinge point. And it is powerful. What I have seen for students who are able to even share openly that they have a disability in that space, that means that that teacher has created a very humanized community. And people that may not be identified with a particular disability, they're able to share things that they struggle with as well. And it builds a sense of community. That's how we're able to increase student learning outcomes for all. Now, for the educators, this is the part that I know you really want to hear about. So for the educators, we're asking four things. Number one, be curious. Two, be courageous. Three, be bold. And four, be appreciative. This is so important as you work with a variety of students every day. Be curious, ask questions. I'm so serious, it's, it's the most simple thing, but it's a powerful thing. Ask questions and commit to digging deeper, okay? Identify what you need to first of all learn, then unlearn and relearn. And I wanna say this because you have to be curious enough to dig into the what, the why, and the how. And by committing yourself to learn, unlearn, and relearn, you are recognizing that this is just not a one-stop shop when it comes to equity and thinking differently to best serve all students. This is not a one-time event. This is a lifelong journey. I tell people, even when you meet the quote-unquote gurus in the field, they will tell you that in their equity work, they never stop learning and growing. They never stop asking questions. They never stop reading and listening to podcasts and engaging in difficult conversations. Or as you know, Glenn Singleton would say courageous conversations, which leads us to number two, being courageous. This work requires courage to dismantle inequity. It requires you to speak up and to speak out to create that change. And what I'm gonna tell you honestly is that when you do this work, please know that you are going to experience pushback. I will not sit up here and lie to you and say that you won't because you will. You have to be able to think about how you will manage this pushback so that we can combat the naysayers and really speak truth to power about the possibilities of all students and those, those mindsets that are deficit focused. But I want you to know there are costs for the work, but the benefits far outweigh the cost. And so if you are committed to doing this work, just be courageous and stay strong. Three is be bold. As Dr. Linda Bellin said, you can hold their hand while you hold their feet to the fire. Okay, I'm gonna say it again. You can hold their hand while you hold their feet to the fire. And for that, I mean fellow staff members. You can be a thought partner with someone, but you can also be an accountability partner for that person to continue to challenge things that may be grounded in deficit thinking and to help them along the way, but no, they will still be held accountable. You can be a coach for that person because that'll be important as they deconstruct different stereotypes and misinformation to construct new meaning. And then finally, be appreciative. Value the perspectives that other people bring to the table, okay? Everyone needs to be able to speak their truth in a safe space in order to be open to develop new understandings. 
The way you are able to bring people around is for them to start where they are and share their thinking. Maybe they have a lot of deficit mindsets when it comes to students that have special needs. Maybe they've never had the tools and resources needed to meet their needs, but you can come alongside and help them in that thinking but you have to do that only after you've gained trust. If you create a psychologically safe space for them, they're gonna grow a lot more than if they feel unsafe and not able to share their true thoughts. So remember that be curious, courageous, bold, and appreciative. And we're gonna close up with what I call the four Ps. Promise, possibilities, privilege, and power. And that first one that we have, promise, I found this quote by David Vitter. I continue to believe that if children are given the necessary, necessary tools to succeed, they will succeed beyond their wildest dreams. And I believe that. I believe that every child that we encounter, that they have great promise. Our goal is to make sure that our students that we are working with meet the goals that we've set. There are students with visible and invisible disabilities, behaviors that can be challenging at times. Students that come from very challenging circumstances and we're trying to meet them at their point of need, but our goal has to remain on the promise. When you look into their eyes, I always say that's a window to their soul. When you look into their to your eyes, do you see promise? Do you see the promise that's in front of you? And use what you see, that promise, to develop those learning opportunities that are meaning for them, meaningful for them. And I think about this whenever I see the word promise, I think about when I was a little girl in church, we always sang this song, I am a promise, I am a possibility, I am a promise with the capital P. I'm a great big bundle of potentiality, okay? I want you to look at your young people every day as you're working with them. And I want you to help staff members as they're working with them to continue to see that promise. And maybe even sing that little song in your head if you grew up knowing that song, um, because that is there, that promise is there, that potentiality is there. And so the next thing that I want to talk about was possibilities. Know that Maya Angelou says we all have that possibility, that potential, and that promise of seeing beyond the scene. That quote, that's huge. That's huge. As you're working with young people and looking for ways to provide equitable access for them in education, in that school setting, I want you to allow yourself to dream and explore possibilities. I want you to set high expectations and hold yourself and other, others accountable. Students with exceptional needs deserve high quality learning experiences. They deserve access to higher level courses. And just because this, was, this class has been taught the way it's always been taught, that means now it's time for a new way of thinking because they, are, they have brilliance, they are intelligent, they have things to share, things that are just mind blowing with the thoughts that they have to help make our world a better place and to create more access for other students. I want you to really think about is the fact that they have an ILP or even if it's an English learner, an ILP, is that inhibiting them from these opportunities? And if so, what must, not, I'm not gonna say what can be, what must be done to break away that barrier for them? We have to make sure that staff members are not blinded by the fact that they have an IEP. I've heard people in higher level courses say, I didn't even know the student had an IEP. Well, you should know, but it doesn't change the way you think about them as an individual because they've worked hard to get to this space and we need to make sure there are equitable access points for them as well, that access and the opportunity. I want you to give yourself again that permission to explore possibilities and use your voice to ensure equitable outcomes for them. I want you to be able to have that relationship with them so they know they can come to you and talk to you and that you will be there for them and advocate for them along the way. I want us to think about the word privilege. We've heard that, you, that word used in so many different ways during equity work, but I want you to identify that privilege. Archbishop Desmond Tutu says, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And that's deep for me, because for me, that means when these comments were shared, did I sit there and stay quiet? Or did I actively use my voice 
to make sure that student was not marginalized? Did I wanna work harder at keeping the peace? Or did I wanna work harder for giving this young person the access that they deserve? It is a privilege and an honor to come alongside our students that have special needs. It is a privilege to contribute to the dismantling of structures that do not serve them well at all. It is a privilege to create pathways for students from historically marginalized groups so they can thrive in the educational setting. It is a privilege to watch them experience full joy when they come to school every day. We don't want them just trudging through the seven plus hours of school every day and just waiting to get home. We want them to experience full joy. We know it's a privilege to build relationships with students, partner with families and connect with community members. So the question I have for you is, how are you using your privilege to advocate for students and increase access to equitable learning opportunities for all of them? And then this last powerful P is power. Audrey Lord, if you've ever done anything with her work, she is powerful herself. But she says, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I'm afraid. And I say that to you because again, this work is challenging. Equity work is hard as you're pushing back, as you're challenging mindsets, because you have the power to ensure humanity is at the heart of all decisions regarding your students. And I use the word humanity because that's what you have to think about as you look at each individual you serve. I want us to think about interest convergence. In equity work, you will hear the concept of interest convergence, and it was developed by Derek Bell. It focuses on the idea that the majority will only support the interests of a minoritized group of people if their interests align, okay? Now, true equity advocates, they're going to fight for causes knowing there's going to be a cost for them. But think about this for a moment. If we think about interest convergence and we think about equity work, they're like in direct conflict with each other. Because what might be good for this particular group of people, but harmful for this group? Equity warriors, we come in as advocates and we push against that, but it pushes against our very nature. But no, it does not have to be an either or or. I want you to think about how we can push back on entrance convergence and really open up doors of opportunity for those that really need equitable access who have been denied that for so long. I want you also to think about this work because no matter what, you have to commit to leveling the playing field. You have to dismantle structures that inhibit them from their optimal learning opportunities. And you can do it step by step, brick by brick. Create coalitions of support for yourself and identify where you're going to stand when this work is taking shape, how you're gonna use your voice. And as we get ready to close, I want us to think about this. Because this is important, if you're going to continue in this work to create equitable opportunities for all, we've heard so much about self-care, but I wanna call it self-love. Self-love, giving yourself that time to reset, rejuvenate and recharge. Because this work, I put it into three categories, humanity, the who, advocacy, the what, and empowerment, the how. The who, that's our historically marginalized students. The advocacy is transferring voice into action and empowerment is helping people to get the support they need, that authority and that power. But that is a lot to do for one individual. That's a lot. So how are you gonna engage in self-love? Ask yourself how you're gonna take care of yourself. Is it journaling? Because this work is hard. You can go in really hard, but it's gonna take a lot on you mentally and at times physically, because we know what impacts us mentally has an impact on our physical health. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna commit to doing this work, but then also commit to taking care of yourself? Whether it's journaling, meditation, exercise, going out to eat, for some people, a Netflix and chill night, whatever it is going to be, but create that space so that you have the support that you need and the rest that you need to reset, rejuvenate, and recharge. Create that time for yourself. Connect with others who are doing the work. 
Because if you don't take care of yourself and they say you can't pour from an empty cup, that is real. And I've been someone engaged in this work for so long and I've seen the impact of not taking care of myself and what it has done for me and having to make that mental shift to make sure it's done. And as we get ready to wrap up, I know we have to have Q&A at the end. I want us to just pause on this thought. Our historically marginalized students, they do value education. When they come to school in kindergarten, they want to be there, they want to learn and grow. But sometimes as things come up, they can find themselves in hostile and unwelcoming learning environments. So it's our job to disrupt the status quo, okay? We have to disrupt the status quo that sees many students with exceptional needs through a deficit lens. And we can do this by looking at equity, inclusivity, anti-racist, culturally responsive teaching and learning environments to create that space where all, and we do mean all, because all means all, all students can thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Denisha. That, I I mean, I had to take a breath there at the end. I could barely keep up. It was fantastic. I hope everyone shares the excitement that I just felt just listening. And I felt like I was walking alongside you as you were talking about your journey. It was amazing, truly amazing. Um, at this time, we are open for questions um, for Denisha, for D Dr. Murph, excuse me. Anyone having um, any questions? Let's see. Um, it says here, buy-in. We are a district fully in support of inclusion, but at the high school level, we are struggling with buy-in from teachers and admin. Any comments, um, Dr. Murph, you'd want to give about the high school level with buy-in? Um, absolutely. I think the biggest thing at the high school level is looking at access points. And as I said, having a child that has a, has a disability, um, it was really about conversations and advocacy, showing them that this child may not be able to um, read this entire text in a week, but if we provide them with different outlets, the same work can get done, looking at the scheduling aspect of it. So really it was about showing them that it's not a whole bunch more work for you. It's about a different ac um, access point. It's about a different pathway. And my baby was still able to understand that text and be able to do all the things, um, just not that, that mental of trying to cram this, this text in that, you know, that one week's time. And it was a lot of reading. So finding that one person that can be the advocate and that starting point and looking at ways to make the access easier. That was a huge part of it for us. And once the teachers could see that, the whole, I mean, I would say the mindset changed. Oh, we'll just give this to him in this format. And he's still able to participate in the written assignments as well as the, the classroom discussions. Love it. Anyone else want to put your questions in the chat? Any comments, any accolades, anything that you want um, Denisha to hear or know about? So you've got a few more minutes. And while, while you're thinking about your questions, anything you'd like to ask her, um, please remember I put a link in the chat box um, to provide feedback on the session and the symposium. You can complete this after each session at the end of the day. Um, it is required to receive your PGP points, which is exciting for your attendance. And so it's also available on the symposium's main page on Sketch. So again, we just want to thank you for joining us this morning. It was the um, most perfect way to start my day. Um, we, I think we have another, let's see here. Oh, here's exit ticket. Thank you, whoever put that in there. Another question. Um, okay. Anything else to put in the question and answer? Sorry, I've not, I don't moderate professionally. I'm trying. <laughs> Um, here's a comment about, loved her comment of stop fixing the students, fix the system. I've struggled with this and I'm hoping to help those around me. That's a great, a great comment as well. We have about two or three more minutes for any additional questions. Oh, we have some participants that have raised their hands. Just thank you for validating that the struggle is real in order to be bold. Okay. 
Okay, we'll fix the exit, exit ticket link. Don't worry, we'll fix that. <laughs> yeah, we will fix it. here oh the hands raised okay i see it says, i am uh, looking go ahead sorry Denise. i think i figured it out michael reynolds oh yeah i'm not sure if he's able to unmute i asked him to unmute yes yay hi hello hello hi. can you hear us yes Ask away, Michael. You've got the floor. Oh, I I didn't have a question. Did it say I had a question? I said your oh, hand was yeah. raised. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Let me lower it then. Okay. okay. Never mind. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're good. I think wonderful session. Great way to begin this conference. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. All right. I, let's see here. I think at this time, Dr. Murph, we we can be we can be complete. We're finished. It was a great session. Good job. Cool. Thank you so much. It was so good to see you. I'm glad I was able to talk with everyone. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited for the rest of the session. Yeah. yeah. I okay.